having you two on the panel would be really interesting because even though your work is seemingly different, there's an interesting through line. In some sense, Ari, you're covering sort of the structures and the organizations of limiting who can participate in democracy. And AC, you're covering, you know, the movements on the ground that are working uh, to, to reach that same end goal. So AC, I want to start with you. Um, you've been out there reporting in the field. You've attended a number of rallies by former President Trump. What are you seeing? Is the enthusiasm for Trump and his ideologies fading, both in these on the ground events, but also on, on online platforms? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm a, I guess I'm a relentlessly naive person um, because I thought after January 6th, I thought there'd be this chastening moment and that we, we would see with extreme right movements, we would see this sort of um, people, people moving away from the most extreme ideas that were expressed on that day. And uh, I'm told, I was totally wrong, 100% wrong. So when you go to the big Trump rallies and when you go to the election uh, fraud rallies and when you go to the Macomb County GOP meetings in Michigan, what you find over and over and over again is there are mass numbers of people that absolutely believe that Joe Biden is an illegitimate ruler, that he has illegally usurped the power, that democracy is rapidly colla has collapsed before our eyes, and that um, possibly violent means are necessary to undo all this. You know, when you're in Perry, Georgia, and Trump is speaking to 30,000 people, besides all the typical demagoguery, uh, immigrants are evil, the media is evil, the rhinos, the Republicans in name only are evil, the Democrats are all socialists and communists who want to destroy the country. The other main message is we're no longer living in a democracy, the election was stolen, and you need to take dramatic extreme action. So I think that's absolutely an animating concept out there for the Republican base. And I don't think that that idea and that energy around that has waned at all since January 6th. No one said like, oh, maybe we shouldn't bring a guillotine to the Capitol. What they said is like, what they're saying now is like, yeah, maybe we should bring more guillotines to the Capitol and kill more people, frankly. Yeah, I mean, Ariel, turn to you. You're one of the country's preeminent reporters on voting rights. You know, we're now less than six months away from the midterms, and we all know that there's been a concerted effort to limit who gets access to voting. Um, and in one of your recent pieces, you actually called it a full-scale assault on the election system. You know, do you think those efforts are going to bear fruit in the next few months, and how do you see that playing out? Well, first off, thanks so much uh, for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be back here, and it's an honor to be uh, on with uh, AC and have Sumi moderating and see so many amazing people uh, in the crowd. As AC said, the fever is spreading, um, not breaking, uh, in the Republican Party, and their radicalization against democracy, which I've been following for a decade, is getting worse. And I believe that we are in a war for democracy uh, at home, and it's different than the war that was being so bravely covered uh, in Ukraine. You could argue that the insurrection was uh, a central front in that battle and that the insurrectionists were uh, the ground troops, uh, but I think it's been more like a death by a thousand cut strategy and really a counterinsurgency against democracy, which is you close a polling place here, you purge some voters there, you remove some drop boxes there, and then if all of that doesn't work to rig the election on the front end, then you try to overturn the election on the back end. And that's really what's changed now. I've been covering efforts to make it harder to vote for a decade, so these aren't new. But what's happening is the scope of these efforts are increasing, and then the efforts to actually subvert elections themselves is really the wild card in here. And I do believe that we're seeing some of these efforts bear fruit already. One of the things that's difficult as a journalist is it might have been that a few years ago a state might have passed a law that had one thing that made it harder to vote. Like let's say a voter ID law or a cuts to early voting or a voter purge. You look for example the law that was passed in Texas recently. It had 20 different provisions that made it harder to vote. So you don't even know going into the election what's going to have the biggest impact and in the recent primaries in Texas we saw the level of mail ballot rejections in Texas reach 12%. 
12% of all mail ballots in Texas were rejected. I mean, imagine if more than one in 10 people in this room had their ballots rejected, how fucking pissed off you would be. That's what's happening right now in Texas. And again, this was one part of one law that was buried in the bill. And what it was basically was that the ID that you had to put on your mail ballot had to be the same ID you use when you registered to vote. Well, nobody knows what ID they put when they registered to vote. Did you put your driver's license? Did you put your voter registration number? Did you even have to put that number? Because a lot of people were born so long ago, they didn't have to have any identification when they registered to vote. And this is when it starts becoming like counting the number of jelly beans in a jar. This is when it starts to becoming the kind of things like literacy pests and poll taxes that are more sophisticated. So I'm very, very concerned with where things are headed. I'm concerned with how the laws have changed, but I'm also concerned with who's running for offices in all these places to write the next wave of laws going into 2024, because 2022 is just a test run for what they ultimately want to do in 2024. Yeah, I mean, that brings us to sort of the next point is we all know about the slate of candidates who are running for office at the national, state, local level, right, who are endorsers of the big lie. That's almost become this litmus test, especially for Republican candidates. And so, you know, we did a show on this a few weeks ago where we looked at Michigan specifically, and that very much the voters that we heard from were very much, you know, this is what it is, and if you don't support that, you're not gonna make it through your primary challenge or whatever challenge. Um, you know, in terms of your reporting on the ground right now, it, are you getting a sense that these candidates will prevail, that this tack will be successful, and that this is now the future of one of our parties? Yeah, absolutely. I, it's gonna be so interesting, and I'm interested to hear what, what you think on this, but. The, the midterms, I think we're going to see a lot of the Trump big lie candidates prevail. Not all of them, but my guess is probably most of them. And these are people with incredibly radical views. I hung out with um, Mark Fincham, who is running for Secretary of State in Arizona. He was kind of a backbencher, assembly member. He was a nobody, frankly, before the Stop the Steal movement. And he helped really catalyze that movement in the state of Arizona. There's a strong chance he's going to he's going to be the next Secretary of State in charge of administering elections there. And when you kick it with Mark, he will drop one nugget after another, one gem after another. He'll say, hey, come out to my car with me. You gotta see my body armor. It's level four body armor that'll keep you from getting killed by an assault rifle round. I'm gonna wear this down to the border because the borders are controlled by the cartels. And dude, it's all a plan. The globalists and Marxists have a plan to let migrants across the border to come vote in our elections and install a socialist, left-wing, Marxist, Democrat government. Dude, that's what's going on. But you know, even if you're on the US side of the border, you gotta wear your body armor. It's dangerous, man. And I'm like, you're from Michigan, dude. You don't know what you're talking about. But anyway, <laughs> you know, you now live in Arizona, but you're, you're from Michigan, let's be real. But that's the, kind of, that's the kind of person we're talking about. Mark is a guy who doesn't believe climate change exists. He believes that the January 6th oper uh, insurrection was likely a false flag operation staged by Antifa and the Marxists. He, he was there. He was there. He was there. And, he'll t and he'll tell you, like, oh, I didn't really like, get too close, but that's a little... Um, his, his statements about what he did that day, I think, are worthy of scrutiny. Um, he's a guy who will tell you... Uh, who was a member of the Oath Keepers and was a member of that anti-government militia group. He's, good chance, will be your next Secretary of State. And I think he's kind of representative of yeah. this new wave of candidates. Yeah. I mean, I think the really important thing to understand is that voter suppression has become the central organizing principle of the Republican Party. That it was previously, even when I was first covering this, kind of a fringe thing. It was mostly top down. Now it's what they all are running on, it's much more bottom up than before. In many cases, it's the base demanding their leaders act rather than uh, the other way around. And I don't believe that 2022 is a normal midterm election. I think it's a big mistake to view this as Democrats versus Republicans. Mm -hmm. uh, this right now is the Republican Party versus democracy. And I think that's the major shift that we in the media have to make to understand this is not 
Thank you. This is not, you know, this is not even Ronald Reagan's Republican Party. This is not George W. Bush's Republican Party. This is a Republican Party that is sliding more and more into authoritarianism. And I think it's very possible a lot of these people are going to win in what is going to be a bad year for Democrats. The only question is how bad is it? But we know that some of these people, if not all of them, are going to win. And I think it's very possible we could slide into a situation, which is what political scientists call competitive authoritarianism, which is we have a elections, but they're basically a facade. And the results are predetermined in so many cases ahead of time. And if you look at states like Wisconsin at the state legislative level, we're already there because of extreme gerrymandering. Right now in places like Wisconsin, no matter what happens in a 50-50 state, Republicans are going to get 65 percent of the state house and 70 percent of the state senate because of the maps they drew. So there is no more democracy at the state level in Wisconsin and Texas and Georgia and all of these places. And now we're saying, okay, we've taken huge numbers of races just completely off the table. And now we're fighting for a smaller and smaller number of races that are competitive. And those competitive races right now are being run by people that don't believe in democracy anymore. So what's it gonna look like when people who don't believe in democracy are in charge of the democratic process? And that's the thing that is really concerning to me, because what is Mark Fincham going to do with his power? What's Jody Heiss in Georgia going to do with their power? They're not running just to hold these offices. There's stuff they want to do when they get there, and it's going to be a lot worse, in my opinion, than what they've already done. I mean, that brings me to a question that I've been wrestling with a lot is, you know, it's part of like the journalistic canon of objectivity, and you've got to sort of maintain this sense of being able to look at both sides. but when we have one political party that is essentially working to dismantle democracy and its institutions, how do you kind of balance that idea of wanting to maintain objectivity, which is a problematic concept in, in and of itself, but in terms of our reporting, how do we kind of overcome this, you know, sort of ethic that we've been taught, and where do you draw the line as you're doing your reporting? You know, for me, I, I tell people that, like, I don't think it's, um, I don't think there's two sides to fascism or democracy. Yeah. Like that's yeah. like, I'm not gonna have like the fascist voice in my story be like, fascism's great, we should get down with that. And then have like the, the opposite voice saying, nah, maybe fascism is not, isn't that cool. We should probably get away from that. No, I think our role as journalists is to uh, hold people who are saying things that are untrue accountable, say what the truth is, and uh, that we're operating from a, a premise that we believe in, in free expression, we believe in the free transfer of information, and we believe in free countries that are not ruled by authoritarians. And so I, I don't, I, I think it's like pretty easy to deal with there. But here, but the thing is as well, I want to be empathetic and thoughtful and hear out people's perspectives. And I'm interested in what people have to say, how they come to these views, how they come to these positions. Um, and I think it's important to hear that. I think it's also um, worth understanding that like a lot of the people that have been terrorized by the authoritarian conspiratorial turn of the Republican Party are other Republicans. There are people like the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors which oversaw the election in, in the Phoenix area and have been threatened with death relentlessly since they said, hey, look, there was no fraud. Uh, Biden won. We voted for Trump, but Biden won. Those people have been terrorized. People like Brad Raffensperger, yeah. the Secretary of State in Georgia, has been terrorized. And I think hearing people out, listening to what their, their issues are, their grievances are, understanding how they got to where they are, but also calling out their bullshit is how you do the work, to me. Yeah. I mean, I, I think AC is absolutely right. To me, the truth is more, much more important than objectivity. And especially with something as fundamental as this, I think one of the mistakes that a lot of people in the media have made is treating this as a partisan issue and treating this as a left versus right, Democratic versus Republican issue, when I think it really is a moral issue that the right to vote is preservative of all other rights. And if we don't have a strong right to vote, that affects everybody. It doesn't just reflect, doesn't just affect Democrats, it doesn't just affect people on the left, it affects everybody. And when Lyndon Johnson introduced the Voting Rights Act before a joint session of Congress, he said, this is not a North versus South issue, it's not a black versus white issue, it's an American issue. And he said it was wrong, deadly wrong, to prevent any of your fellow Americans from voting. He framed the Voting Rights Act, even though it was in many ways a regional issue, even though it was in many ways 
a, a racial issue. He framed it as a moral issue. And I think that's how he broke through. And I think we have to frame it in a lot of the same kind of ways. And one of the arguments I've also been making to Republicans is it's fine to disagree about taxes and lots of other issues. It's healthy to disagree on democracy, but let's agree on democracy and move from there. And I think there is an opportunity to have a coalition that includes people who disagree on a lot of policy things, but agree on preserving American democracy. Is that enough to overcome the insurrectionists? I don't know, I'm not, I, I think it's really an open question, but I think it's clear that there's very strong majority support in this country, if you look at Democrats, independents, and maybe 30% of Republicans for preserving American democracy. The question is, is the two thirds of Republicans that don't believe in democracy, which is a minority of Americans, is that minority going to hijack the majority institutions in our country? And that's what I'm most afraid of right now. Yeah, but isn't there some sense of we're just preaching to the choir then? We're already talking to people who sort of have that same underlying set of common facts. And you know, how do you go about then trying to create this shared sense of reality or facts with people who genuinely believe the 2020 election was stolen, who genuinely believe that all of these efforts, you know, that, that votes are being harvested, you know, that all of these sort of, um, all this foul play is happening around our election systems. How do you build common ground with them? Great question. Um, I'm not. I'm not texting with my friends. I'm. I'm reading this from um, from alternative right wing social media. The download I got today, and this is the kind of stuff people are talking about. This is on Getter, which is the sort of Steve Bannon affiliated social media outfit, and people are saying, "Do you certify?" Or unfortunately, we are headed to a civil war. The American people have no other options. This is uh, on another on another network. Tennessee c citizens need to picket the DA's office and demand justice. BLM burned down cities, yet conservatives do nothing to get justice. We need the death sentence for voter fraud, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is like, there are a million versions of this in the whole alternative social media ecosystem, which sprang up when the mainstream social media platforms began booting conspiratorial, racist, and hateful right-wingers from those sites. And there is an entire uh, worldview, a self-reinforcing worldview that is being developed in this space that most of us really are not in. And that's the telegrams, the getters. Uh, I don't think anybody's on truth social network, but um, on, on all these other sort of spaces, the alternative spaces. And just like our, our colleagues from Russia were saying about trying to break through the information blockade, there I honestly do not know how to reach people who are in that sort of cocoon of information and self-reinforcing sort of have that, that worldview, that filter bubble. I'm not totally sure how you do that. I think that's a key challenge for us as journalists and for policymakers and anybody that is concerned about the future of democracy to understand how are we going to begin to communicating to people uh, and to redevelop a shared set of facts. I don't know. What do you think? Well, I mean, I think it's very, very difficult when you have someone who was president and now has a massive following just telling people every day things that are just completely untrue. I think it's very, very hard to message against that. Uh, and I think we are seeing the obstacles to doing that right now that even I don't even think Fox News is driving this. No, no, I no. honestly don't think that Fox News has been driving any of this. It's so much more fringe um, than that. And then it, it starts to become, well, this is in some ways the democratization of the media, yeah. right? So we've all been saying, let's democratize the media. Well, we democratized the media and what happened? Millions and millions of people went to fringer and fringer outlets that aren't true. So I think uh, I'm curious to hear what the disinformation um, panel have to say with this. I don't think we can compromise um, with these people and I don't think we can persuade them. Um, I think that they have to be defeated. And I think they have to be defeated in the same way that people who believed in poll taxes and literacy tests were defeated in the 1950s and 60s. At some point, the federal government realized you couldn't out-organize poll taxes and literacy tests. You couldn't litigate against them. You had to just abolish them altogether. That's what the voting rights did. That's why it was so consequential. It didn't change hearts and minds of every racist white Southerner. It took away the tools they had implement their racism into law. 
And to me, that's what we need today. And that's why I believe the failure of the Democratic Party to pass voting rights legislation will be so consequential. Because there was a very brief moment when the Democratic Party had the power to stop this. They chose not to. We are going to live with the ramifications of that inaction for decades. In the same way that what would this country have looked like if we had not passed a Voting Rights Act in 1965. I think we're going to think about the failure to pass federal legislation to protect voting rights in the same way two or three decades later when it's very possible we have a completely authoritarian Republican Party running whole sectors of this government. Yeah, looking forward a little bit, you know, there's been some really great reporting on the lead up to... Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Just like that's... Sumi, Sumi said that this conversation was going to be depressing. We'll, we'll try to turn it around. I know, we're going to try to end on a bright spot, but we'll see. <laughs> um, you know, but looking forward, when we think about the, the groups that were involved in the January 6th insurrection, right? I mean, AC, you've done a ton of reporting on this. You know, the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the Boogaloo Boys. Are these the same players in the on-the-ground movements that we need to be thinking about sort of in the next version of whatever this is going to be? Or are there new players? Or what are the next set of targets in your estimation? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, when I talk to extremist researchers now, they are telling me that they have a problem, and it's that you used to be able to draw pretty easy lines between the extremists and the normies, and that like the worldviews were very different. And I could see that, you know, 2016, 2017, you could see like there is a contingent of people that have relatively mainstream views, whether they're left or right, and there's a contingent of people who I'm seeing at Charlottesville who are insane Nazis who are killing people, and they're very different worldviews. Now we have this problem, right, where the conspiratorial, anti-government extremist worldview is a mainstream um, plank of the Republican Party, right? So the worldview that animated people like Tim McVeigh, that animated the anti-government militias that animates people like Stuart Rhodes, the leader of the Oath Keepers, that's not an extremist view anymore. That's a view that is adhered to, uh, according to the social science, by something like two-thirds of Republican voters. So I think in a lot of ways, what we're talking about now is not small extremist groups led by um, somewhat kooky individuals who might be racist and awful. We're talking about how do you de-radicalize an entire political party. I think that's really the, the issue. It's a, it's, a different, it's a different struggle, I would say. Yeah, I, I think that Trumpism without Trump is more dangerous than Trumpism yeah. with yeah. Trump. I think Ron DeSantis is a greater threat to democracy than Donald Trump is right now because he understands how to work the system. Mm -hmm. Trump is incompetent. Trump didn't know what he was doing. He inspired a lot of people to believe things that weren't true, but he's not a fundamentally competent leader. Scott Walker, Ron DeSantis, these are people that know how to work through power. And so to me, what I'm more concerned about is not the insurrection. I'm concerned about what I call the insurrection through other means, the attempt to institutionalize the insurrection and the people that actually know what they're doing in Georgia and Florida and Arizona. They're running with it and they're institutionalizing it in a way that Trump wasn't able to do in his incompetent ad hoc manner. And the Republican Party is far more organized around this issue now. And I think there's far more consensus within the party that people believe. People are pitting Donald Trump against Mitch McConnell. People are pitting John Roberts against Donald Trump. But they're all working off the same playbook, in my view, which is that you know, the Supreme Court is very likely to say in you know, the next term that state legislatures can basically do whatever they want, that they have unlimited authority over federal election laws. Well, that's going to make it a lot easier for Donald Trump to try to overturn the election in 2024 if essentially the Supreme Court is already, through the normal process of these things, green lit this kind of behavior. So I think what we saw was democratic norms held in 2020 because Trump tried to do these things in an undemocratic way. What if you try to do it in a democratic way? What if you pass laws through a normal process? What if you uphold these laws through the courts? What if it has the veneer of democracy behind it? Then it becomes a lot harder to try to reverse. Yeah. Um. <laughs> All right, I'm going to try to, to take us to a slightly more. Is there any reason to be hopeful? Because you both are painting a pretty dire picture here. 
Um, yeah. I mean, the panel was called Lights Flashing Red, so <laughs> no, you got what you paid for. But, you know, I mean, a, a thing that I would say is, is I go to these rallies, there's a contingent of people that are threatening our lives and the lives of my, my crew, and then there's a contingent of people that actually do want to have a conversation, and they are expressing, like, I, I would say legitimate grievances, and they'll say things like, you and I talked about this, like, here I am in Michigan, I work in a factory, I watched as all the jobs in my factory got exported for 20 years, and neither the Democrats or Republicans cared. And this guy named Donald Trump came along and he seemed to actually care about factory workers. And that's why I'm here and that's why I'm active for Donald Trump and all this stuff. And you feel with people like that, you can start a conversation and you can, you can find um, that they are not entirely unreasonable people, that they have true uh, grievances that have been ignored by both parties and frankly been ignored by people in our space, in the media space for a long time. And that, that there is perhaps a window to start a conversation there. Yeah, and, and I would just say that I think that the uh, increased amount of attention to the threats that we're facing to our democracy has the potential to counteract it. That um, when I, part of that's because things have gotten worse, but also, you know, when I first started covering voting rights, I mean, I didn't even know that there was such a thing as a voting rights beat. Um, and so now the fact that, you know, so many people are covering this issue, um, it's becoming so much more front and center in terms of people's coverage, uh, I think is really positive. I would just urge people to think about democracy not as one of many beats, but as a beat that affects every other beat. I would urge you guys to think about how every issue you care about comes back to whether we have a healthy democracy and whether it's criminal justice reform or immigration reform or climate change or abortion rights, to think about how does the rollbacks of our American democracy make it harder to make progress on all of these other issues. Because I think one of the reasons why we haven't made progress on all of these other issues is because um, democracy is being undermined. So I would urge all of you to make democracy in one way or another a central part of your coverage and then also just cover it in your own backyard. I think that's so critically important. I mean, you went out um, around the country, but there's only so much that you can do that. And, you know, I'm a national reporter. I'm focused on all of these other places. I really rely a tremendous amount on state and local reporting uh, to know what's going on. And so I think that kind of reporting is really important. I think there's a story, uh, no matter where you live, it's either a story of democracy being done well, that can be emulated by other states, or democracy being undermined in a way that's being exported to other states that we should know about. But either way, I would say that, to me, democracy is the central story of our time, and we all have a role to play in covering it. I mean, to dig into that a little bit, right, for our colleagues here in the room who work at local or regional news organizations, right, you guys are both national reporters, you have time, you have the scope to be able to take a big picture view on democracy. If you are working in a smaller news organization, what would be your advice on how to dig into these issues in your own communities? Um, you know, for me, I always go to the scary people. So I, I, I'm interested by things like this. You know, when I'm in Arizona and I'm watching the audit of the 2020 vote be released, I'm looking at the social media feeds of the state senators there who are releasing this document. And I'm seeing that as they are um, posting about, oh, here's our proof that there was election fraud, here's um, you know, our big reveal of the audit, um, what I'm seeing is that their followers are immediately jumping online and talking about killing public officials. And they're talking about hanging public officials from trees, they're talking about executing traitors, and I'm not seeing any pushback from those state senators as this is all going on on their social media pages. So a thing for me, if I'm a local reporter, is I want to know who these people are in the community who are posting, let's go kill some government officials. I want to know why people like Wendy Rogers, the state senator in Arizona, and others don't push back when people use their social media platforms to threaten violence. I want to know about the public health officer in my community who's getting threats that isn't being reported on. I want to know about the elections workers who are being threatened. I think there's a ton to do. Yeah, I would just urge uh, you know, as much local coverage as possible, as much state and local coverage as possible, and as much investment in state and local 
uh, coverage as possible. I mean, I, I couldn't do my job without the Texas Tribune and the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and the Atlanta Journal Constitution, and a lot of these places are facing um, major economic pressures as well, and so um, they need uh, more support. And in general, uh, so much attention is focused nationally. But really what the Republican Party has done is they've taken a state-by-state -state strategy and they've tried to make it a national strategy. And I think that, for example, state legislatures are the most important but undercovered subject in American politics right now, that a tremendous amount has been happening in the states in places like Wisconsin and Florida and Georgia and Texas in the last year. <laughs> Um, but Tell them about Wisconsin, well, yeah. about the auditor's report. What you, it was crazy. I mean, the number of people covering this stuff is shrinking and shrinking, yeah. you know? And uh, so if anyone's here from those states, please come talk to me um, afterwards. But yeah, I mean, they're, they're, just, they're just putting out really crazy stuff that is then filtering up to the national level. And that's, you know, that's where Trump is getting his material. It's not like Trump is getting the material and giving it um, to people in those places. They're, they're getting the material and they're giving it. Um, to Trump, and so I think just as much uh, as much state and local reporting as possible, and as much state and local reporting on this subject in general, I think is going to be tremendously important going forward. Yeah, AC, as you're out in the field, and you know, when we were talking earlier, you were telling me about you know all the safety precautions you have to take, and um, you know, I think one of the things that really comes across in your films when you're talking to people who have just sort of completely radically different views of the 2020 election or the insurrection or any of those things, you are able to approach them with a sense of respect um, and, and trying to have empathy for them, um, which I think is not true necessarily of all national coverage, right? There is a certain amount of, of navel gazing about sort of like how can these people hold these views? I mean, where does that come from for you? Like, is it just a natural sense of curiosity yeah, I mean, I, I do want to hear what led people to to the beliefs that they have. And I'm, you know, honestly constantly astounded that I meet people who are very, very bright people and they're aerospace engineers, they are um, sophisticated, intelligent people, and I want to understand what led you to this, um, embracing this worldview. And I, I would also say that, you know, when I speak to researchers in this field, they will often say, um, particularly with the most sort of extreme extremists, the white, the white power and the very extreme anti-government extremists, that often these are people who have had insane trauma in their lives. They've had very bad things happen to them and part of what took them down this path was that personal trauma that they occurred. And I'm not, I'm not excusing their actions or their worldview, but I do wanna understand how, um, how they got to that place. And I think that's, that's important. Can I just make, say one thing? Yeah. I think it's important to understand, um, to have empathy for the people that are doing this. I think it's more important to have empathy for the people that are on the other end of it, um, the victims of the rollbacks of democracy. And I think that's, again, a story that we haven't told well enough yeah. and that these are not statistics. These are not names on a lawsuit. These are people that we're talking about. And I think one of the ways to break through the some of the clutter on this is to tell these stories, to tell the people the stories of the people that couldn't vote because their polling place was closed or they were purged from the voting rolls or they weren't able to obtain ID because they didn't have access to their birth certificate. You know, one of the things that frustrated me so much about the debate over voting rights in the last year was people with blue check marks, I'm one of them, people with blue check marks sitting behind their desk in New York saying there's no such thing as voter suppression in Georgia or in Texas. If they had spent any time talking to people on the ground there, if they had spent any time traveling around to these places, if they had spent any time embedding in vulnerable communities, they would have known not just the history of voter suppression in this country, but the people affected by it now. And so there's been a lot of navel gazing by pundits from some of the outlets in this room that has done a huge disservice to the coverage of this issue. And I would just urge people, you can't cover the attack on democracy from behind a desk. You can't cover it on Twitter. You have to go out in the field and understand these stories and talk about, make the statistics, make the lawsuits, put a human face to that. And I think that ultimately not just has the most journalistic power, but I think it also has the most power to ultimately change how we think about this issue in general and to try to break through some of the clutter 
and debate over things like restrictions on voting rights that we might not ever agree on, but we will agree that it's fundamentally not right for people to be turned away from the polls or not have access to vote in the first place. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good point. Because as we've been saying, right, all day yesterday and all the sessions, the through line is, is like, people care about stories. They care about other people. There's like, like a humanity that we need to bring to it. And especially on these topics, it's very easy, especially voting rights, because it can be so wonky to just kind of revert to sort of the legal battles or the litigation or the, you know, battle in the legislature. But you're right, like those stories, those human stories of people are not necessarily being told. Um, if you, um, you know, so other than sort of getting out in the field and sort of standing in line with people as they're waiting to vote, other ideas on how to actually get out there and tell these human stories? Especially yeah. in such a perilous kind of environment? Well, you just did it, so talk about how you approached it. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, in a funny sense, I feel like there's this massive behind a desk research project waiting to be done, which is that we've seen an unprecedented wave of threats and violence directed at, at government officials at all different levels, the school board people, the, elect, the elections people, the public health officers. And I don't think that anybody in the journalism space really understands the scope and scale of that. I think that is a very poorly understood phenomenon. And part of democracy is, having a, is living in a land where people want to go work for the government at any level and help run the damn country. And I have a great fear that people are not gonna wanna do that, because like, why the hell would you wanna be a public health officer right now? Why would you wanna be a county uh, clerk of voting? Yeah. Why, why would you wanna do these jobs when you're just gonna get abused? So I think actually there's a, um, one thing to do is to really dig in on the public record side and understand like the 800 pages that I looked at on Brad Raffensperger, uh, what kind of threats and, and violence are being directed at these people, and as w along with getting out and talking to them about, like, well, what does it mean when you have to flee your house? What does it mean when you have to go into hiding? Why did you quit working as a elections administrator? Um, because there's a lot of that going on. Yeah, there's been a lot of tremendous reporting. I think of the Reuters reporting, for yeah. example, on Ruby Freeman, the poll worker that was harassed uh, in, in Georgia. That was a really good Washington Post story recently on racial gerrymandering in Alabama and actually talking to the person that was the plaintiff in that case and, and telling that story. So again, it's not just a name, it's not just an abstract concept, um, it's a human story. I, I think that the more we can um, do of that, um, the better. I think you have to kind of have an all of the above approach. We need to use data to try to understand these things, to try to quantify these things. When we can say 12% of mail ballots were rejected uh, in Texas, when we can say you know, 45,000 people might have been turned away from the polls in this state or that state, you know, it, it can have an impact in terms of the numbers. So I think we need to dig into the data because there's a lot of data that we can use to understand this. We need to tell the stories of the people most uh, affected by this. We have to put in the work to spend time um, in these communities to understand the larger socioeconomic issues, because voting doesn't just happen in a vacuum. It interplays with all sorts of different socioeconomic disparities in terms of who's most affected um, by voter suppression. And so we have to really um, understand that part of it uh, as well. And then we just have to make it a priority, because for a lot of years it wasn't a priority. And I think it's, it is more of a priority today, um, but even still, a lot of other issues are still coming before it often in terms of coverage. And so we just have to make it you know, a priority every single day and, and not just one or two months before the election. Because often when it's covered one or two mo months before the election, it's already too late in many cases to try to help inform and, and uh, the public and mitigate some of the problems. How do you both think about the impact of your democracy beat, right? Especially when so much of the reporting is happening after the fact or you're dealing with communities who aren't necessarily civically engaged in that way and trying to reach them. So how do you kind of think about impact? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I it's, it. it's difficult. I, I feel like the reporting that I'm doing has never been more important and also never had less of an impact. And that's a difficult thing to think through. That, like, so many people come up to me and they said, you know, you were way ahead of this. You really opened the door to this coverage. But also, tens and tens and tens of millions of people believe the exact opposite 
of what I've been reporting for a decade. And no matter how many impactful stories I write, or no matter how many impactful documentaries you might do, or no matter how many uh, big investigations are done by the Times and the Post and other places that are devoting real resources to it, it's not breaking through in terms of changing the minds of those tens of millions of people that support the insurrection. So that's a very, very difficult thing for us to think through that, to, to think about what are the limits um, to what we're doing. Um, but at the same time, I feel like just not doing it <laughs> would be even worse. So I feel like in, in some ways it, it's more important than ever um, to try to do it and to hope that it has an impact e even uh, in, a, in a small way or uh, in a much bigger way. And one of the things that I took away from 2020 that was really positive was everyone stepped up in their own way to help protect American democracy. Whether it was journalists devoting more issues to covering it, or everyday people deciding to be poll workers, or m so much more attention than the past in helping people vote and understanding how to vote. And I think that's one of the reasons uh, why we had the highest turnout in 2020 in 120 years. It wasn't just that there was more, so much interest in the candidates, it was that so much attention went into the importance of voting and how to actually accomplish that. And m my fear is that a lot of that momentum has now been seeded and the insurrectionists are taking over. And so I think we all have a role to play in terms of what do we do to try to protect American democracy, not in a partisan way, right? But simply writing about this, informing people about it, that in and of itself helps protect American democracy without any political labels, without any partisan labels attached to it. Yeah, I think the impact piece is hard because for me, you know, doing, doing this work, I'm hoping to create some material change on the ground, some have some transformative moment. I'm not just interested in starting a conversation. I, I want things to legitimately change. Uh, and unfortunately, <laughs> as, you, as Ari's saying, it feels like this is a hard space to make that change through journalism at some times. Yeah. Well, I'm going to open it up to audience questions. So maybe we could get some. Um, and convince people who may be radicalized um, to abandon those beliefs. Um, and I just wanted to come back to like a question that you had asked Sumi, which was like, are we like preaching to the choir uh, in our reporting if we're not reaching those people? But I wonder, like, do you guys think that the more important goal that we should have at a time like this is like radicalizing the opposition to those views? You kind of address it a little bit, Ari, but like, can like you you mentioned that Democrats like had the power to do something about this recently when they had uh, control of the House and the Senate and didn't do anything. And like, I talked to my like family members who are like left leaning but don't have like a sort of the sense of urgency that either of you two have about these problems is the should the goal rather be to like instill that sense of urgency in the people that maybe like share our general views but don't share the the sense of like panic or like moral concern that we maybe do because we're like seeing it more often well yeah, that's a really good question that's what i was sort of giving getting at which is i think there is majority support in this country for a pro-democracy movement that could span from Liz Cheney to Bernie Sanders. And again, they're gonna disagree on a lot of things, but they're gonna agree that people who attended the insurrection should not then be running and maintaining public office. And so, I, I mean, I think that if you look at like all of the polling, there's you know, strong majority support for policies that make it easier to vote. There was strong public support for the voting rights legislation in Congress. There is strong majority support that the election was not stolen. We spend so much time thinking about the two-thirds of Republicans that believe the election was stolen and not the 70% of Americans who say the election was not stolen. And so to me, I want to empower the 60 to 70% who believe in democracy to actually defend it rather than worrying about ceding all of the space to the 30%, because I think what's happened basically is the inaction of the 60 to 70% of Americans that believe in democracy for one, whatever reason has ceded turf to the 30% of Americans that are hardcore insurrectionists. And that has left a, a political space for them to really take over in a lot of places. So is that just like a turnout game at that point? That's an everything game. Uh, there's a, that's, it's, it's turnout, but you know, listen, if you're saying that the protection of democracy depends on one party winning all the elections, well then you're not really a democracy anymore. 
Because what happens when the public turns on that party for reasons that have nothing to do with democracy? Like right now, people are mad at the Democratic Party because of inflation and lots of other things and fighting for eight months about policy instead of passing policy and all of these things. And so they're, they're, they're getting blamed for it. And then, but it's not an endorsement of the insurrectionists, but the insurrectionists are gonna take it as a mandate for them. But then the, the pushback on that, right, is that if we don't figure out the dis and misinformation piece, then we're constantly gonna have 30% or more of the people who are like, dude, 5G is causing COVID, or yeah. dude, the election was stolen, yeah. or dude, it's like the new world order is coming to take us all over, or it was a pandemic, you know? And so I don't know how to, to figure that part of it out. Either, you know, it seems like somewhere that we have to put energy as media makers and reporters. Yeah, but I think the 1 p.m. panel is gonna <laughs> solve that problem for us. <laughs> no pressure, 1 p.m. panel. <laughs> the gentleman. AC, how you doing? Uh, Ari, how's it going? Uh, Philip Martin, GBH, uh, uh, Center for Investigative Reporting in Boston. I want to ask you about the mainstreaming of extremism. You talked about this uh, to some degree, uh, but you have a number of issues out here uh, that have been essentially hijacked uh, uh, by the reactionary right. Uh, uh, that's a tautology, I know. Uh, but, you, but you have a, a sense that critical race theory, for example, which is a totally nonsensical uh, issue, but that oftentimes is treated as though it is a legitimate debate, uh, even though, of course, these things are not taught, for example, K through, uh, through 12. You have the hijacking of libraries, the banning of books throughout the country, uh, principally in Texas, uh, so on and so forth. You have transphobia that's rampant right now. Um, and in doing stories recently looking at extremist groups in New England, uh, ranging from neo-Nazis uh, to those that are considered acceptable to some degree, like the Proud Boys, uh, I, I'm wondering if you could talk about how these issues have been uh, taken, uh, how they basic, what's the symbiosis between the that which is considered mainstream and that which, at least for a long time, were, were considered um, extremists uh, in the context of the very issues that I just mentioned. And why aren't we talking more about the racial aspects of this, uh, of, of, this of, of the debate that's taking place in the country, that, I, I, which at least is positive as a debate. I don't see it as a debate. I tend to agree with you that there's, uh, there, the notion of uh, two sides of fascism makes no, no sense historically. Uh, and certainly pragmatically, it makes no sense. But I wonder if you could talk about what uh, I call the, ex the mainstreaming of extremism, those things which, again, have been expropriated by um, or amplified by the extreme right, but somehow or another also articulated uh, in some households. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. I, in the run-up to January 6th, I was looking through the parlor posts of all these guys who are members of the Proud Boys, and I had seen them at, at particular individuals at Stop the Steal events in D.C. and so forth, and these were overwhelmingly people who started out as neo-Nazis, had insane criminal records, including drive-by shootings, hate crime attempted murders, and so forth, and now had put on this um, Proud Boys uniform and so they were saying, look, I'm not explicitly racist, but I'm super anti-trans, I'm anti-communist, I don't believe in, and by communist he mean, they would mean anyone um, to the left of Attila the Hun. Um, they would say, you know, uh, they would be pushing these um, tropes about critical race theory and everything else. And the thing that became clear to me pretty quickly is like, oh, if I'm looking at these people's parlor channels, which seem pretty extreme and conspiratorial, and, and racist at times, despite their protestations that they're not Nazis anymore, et cetera. The weird thing is like these um, posts don't really look that different than Donald Trump's Twitter. They look like basically pretty <laughs> similar. And so I think there has been that total collapsing of ideologies and worldviews in many respects. That when you hang out with extremists, and Phil, I know you've talked to and dealt, done these kind of stories, you know, they'll almost invariably say that they're activism was catalyzed by Donald Trump. You know, that's what people tell me over and over again. So I think there's been a, you know, that these two worldviews have, the, the mainstream and the extreme are somewhat indistinguishable at this point. 
Hi. I have two parts to this question. The first one is not a question. You're talking about how you counter a narrative. And the question is, how do you get that, and this is two parts, how do you get that position to be heard at all from people that aren't listening and ever, never reading Mother Jones, never reading what you're doing, how do you get them to hear it? It's not a question of countering it, how do you get it in there? And the second part of it is the first question, which I thought was really important. Does, that, does doing that have a challenge to the fundamental belief in the independence and the neutrality of journalism? Because you're talking about how do you galvanize those people on the other side, in a way, from the people that aren't hearing a message. So that's a two-part question. Hmm. Well, I mean, to be totally honest with you, I don't think my reporting is reaching the 30% of people that don't believe in democracy. And I don't think anyone's reporting in this room is reaching them. And I think we have to be really, really honest about mm. that. Um, we're not reaching them. They're not reading the New York Times. They're not watching cable news. Even, they might not even be watching Fox. They're not following me on Twitter. Um, they're in such rabbit hole fringe media that most of people, myself included, don't follow that on a regular basis. Um, so that's why I'm saying, but I think my reporting is reaching a lot of people that care about democracy. Um, and that's really who it's geared for. Uh, and I think that the increased reporting on this by Frontline and by the Times and by the Post and by Cable News and by ProPublica and all of these places and by local news is helping to galvanize um, the people that believe in democracy, um, but it's not enough. And also we have to be realistic, there's only so much the media can do without political leadership. I mean, the media did an incredible job covering the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 1960s it took Lyndon Johnson passing the Voting Rights Act to actually have a big impact. So the reporting, the footage of Bloody Sunday in Selma catalyzed that movement, but you had to have the political leadership that turned that movement into action, into legislation. To me, that's what we're missing today, that because of a lot of different structural factors, because of the undemocratic nature of the US Senate, because of the undemocratic rules of the filibuster, because of the extreme radical takeover of the Supreme Court. I mean, I could go on and on and on. I don't wanna to get too far ahead of my latest book. Um, but basically, this is all the reasons why a pro-democracy movement is not translating into pro-democracy legislation. And so I think we have to have a bigger conversation, um, not on this panel, on maybe next year, about the uh, anti-democratic nature of our institutions and how to democratize them, because it's really hard to have a pro-democracy movement in the context of institutions that are already stacked against democracy and that are getting worse, not better, in terms of their composition. Yeah, and I would say I see this very much actually in a very traditional role for journalism. Our, our role is not to be stenographers and go to the press conference and credulously take down notes from people who are spewing bullshit. Our job is to say, you are spewing bullshit, here are the facts, here is the reporting that I've done that proves that. And, and I, I, I think that's a pretty classical thing to do. Early in my career, my, my editor would say, yeah, it's good that you've got a quote from this person and a quote from that person, but I wanna know who's right. Like, where are the facts? Get the documents, tell, tell the reader what is actually going on, not just what people are opining is happening. So I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see it as conflict with the kind of a classical mission. Um, thanks, this has been really interesting. Um, I wanna push a little bit more on, I guess I'm following up on what Ari just said about like in the absence of political leadership, we have this absence of political leadership. We have all of this very excellent reporting sort of sprouting like weeds right now, which is good. But I wanna talk about the 60 or 70%, the choir that is being preached to. Um, I think one of the things that may be missing in, well, I guess my question is, do you agree with this? That one of the things that may be missing in the reporting is what am I as a member of the 60 or 70% supposed to do, I mean literally do, I wake up in the morning, I'm outraged that my ballot could have been one of the ones that would be you know, illegitimate or any, any of the things that all of this good reporting is making me really pissed off about. And I think, okay, so then what is the choir that's being preached to? What can we 
do. And I guess I wish that some of the reporting, not all of it, but some of it was helping the 60 or 70 percent better understand that. And I'm just curious if you think there is a better way for journalism to help to do that. Yeah. That's an, that's an interesting question, and I think it, it puts a lot of journalists in an uncomfortable position where then they feel like they're veering um, into advocacy. And so some people are not going to feel comfortable doing that. Some places like Mother Jones are going to feel more comfortable um, doing that. Um, I think in general, what I've noticed is like the way that the, the Times or the Atlanta Journal-Constitution or the Milwaukee Journal-Sentinel, they're spending a lot more time kind of walking through readers. Like this is why it matters. Here are the facts. Like they're doing, this is not to your question, but in just in terms of raising public consciousness, they're doing a lot more explanation of why we should cover this issue in the first place, what the accepted facts are, uh, what the stated rationale for these laws might be, what the actual uh, impact of these laws are. Um, and I think that's really valuable in terms of raising um, public consciousness. But the fact is, there's a lot of different things that people can do. There's not like a one-size-fits-all solution here. It might be you know, volunteer to be a poll worker uh, or an election judge, so an insurrectionist doesn't take that uh, position. It might be volunteer or give money to the groups working on this issue. It might be uh, trying to elect different kind of people um, to the Senate if you live in a place like Arizona, theoretically. Um, it might be that you have a 30-year campaign for a constitutional amendment to make our institutions more democratic, like the right did in the 1970s when they realized they were losing every aspect of American society and they started to try to figure out how do we take over the courts, how do we take over all these institutions that we've been frozen out of. And the Koch brothers didn't think they were going to succeed uh, in 1974. They had a plan to succeed <laughs> in 2010 instead. And so I think some of these things take a much longer time in terms of structural change, but I think like the, the, the problem is it's not one thing that you can do, it's how do you be active in a lot of different ways. And I think the way that journalists are approaching that is just to try to explain this issue in as great of detail as possible so people understand why it matters in the first place. Yeah, I mean, I think part of that is also before, I think, the last election, I don't, I'm not sure how much of the general public understood the mechanics of the electoral process, right? That they're, what do poll workers do? What, like how, like, and so I think like just putting that out there is also really powerful in terms of educating people about the opportunities yeah. that they have to be part of civic life. It's always, uh, it's always dangerous to say I'm from Arizona, but, um, I'm from Arizona, but um, this year is complicated by, it's Navajo presidential year and there's already a very highly contested race up there that brings in voters that are not normally in a cycle. Uh, this, the primary and the general are on the same cycle as the Navajo Nation. And a lot of the times that changes the whole equation in Arizona in ways that makes it a very different statewide race. Uh, the second, the question though I wanted to raise is one of the experiments going on that drives a lot of folks crazy is this year Alaska is going to do uh, 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 rank choice voting in the, both the Senate and the House race. And suddenly the candidates have to get to 50 plus one by the time they get to uh, the final ballot. How, I'm wondering how that will change things. Well, I mean, it's, it's the whole purpose of rank choice voting, at least theoretically, was that you didn't have to choose the lesser of two evils. That if you liked one person, but you thought they couldn't win, you could rank them first and then you could rank the person that you might like a little less but you think might actually win second or third. And you know sometimes that leads to very different people being elected. I know in Oakland, for example, that led to non-traditional people being elected. In some cases, it doesn't make that much of a difference. But the whole idea is if you're more of a consensus person, you don't have to go as far to the extreme so that someone in Alaska like Lisa Murkowski, she has more incentive to be independent now because she can get votes from Democrats, she can get votes from independents, as opposed to worrying about a Republican primary, which I think is pushing so much of the party to the right. So, I mean, if there was ranked choice voting in Georgia, would it change like the entire 
political spectrum, like no, but it might make people like Brad Raffensperger more popular and that the, the whole fight wouldn't be between him and Jody Heiss, his insurrectionist opponent, it would be between you know, people of all different lens of the spectrum in terms of their policy. So I think that's one kind of policy we should be thinking about in terms of how to make the system potentially um, more democratic. One last question. First of all, kudos to an absolutely brilliant panel. Uh, the nervous laughter here uh, tells us what we need to know. Now is the time to panic. This is serious business. If we convene here again, patriots, convene here again next year, it might well have to be surrounded by armed guards. This is a tragedy, uh, the experiment of, of democracy in America going down the tubes. Panic now. Do everything you can. And like Barb said, you get up every morning. We all must be proactive. Uh, our money, our hearts, our daily work. They've highlighted the facts, and there are a thousand facts. Everything, a conspiracy uh, of facts that have led us here. And they've touched on the essence. But next year, hopefully, we will be here again. Uh, to talk about the bulwark of, of freedom and democracy, which is the freedom of the press. Well, there was a reason we named this panel Lights Flashing Red, so to your point. Um, I'll leave you guys with one last question. You've got a room full of investigative reporters, editors, journalists, what is the one thing we all need to go out and do? If you could give us a to-do list, what do we need to do? <laughs> That's a good, no, 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 I, it's a great question. It's a hard one too. And it, we've kind of been wrestling with variations of that, but I think part of it is like, we have to keep doing what we're doing. This struggle is an information struggle. Our, this country needs us deeply to say things that are hard, to say things that are truthful, to say things that are accurate, and to push back when we are seeing this type of activity and these t this type of untruthful bullshit being promulgated en masse. Like, we need to keep doing what we're doing. And that's something of a piety, but I, I think it's true. I would just say, understand that we are in a fight for the very survival of American democracy and cover that with the urgency and the priority and the importance that it deserves. Well, if that doesn't light a fire under all of us. <laughs> Thanks, Ari and Isi.